So the series was titled Going Right in a Culture That Has Gone Wrong. Do you agree that the world has gone wrong? Do you agree that we've not been good stewards of God's earth? And do you feel like the title I was given tonight, When You Feel Like a Nobody Going Nowhere? That was the title I was given. Well, I'm sure that we all do at some time in our life feel like a nobody going nowhere. David the psalmist uh, of this particular psalm realised that he was in touch with the omniscient, omnipresent and omnipotent God. We learn of God's omniscience in being the all-knowing and the all-seeing one. We learn how God is omnipresent, meaning he is present everywhere. And we find David proclaiming God's omnipotence, meaning that he is the all-powerful one. We also see that the psalmist reacts to these majestic truths and his own unworthiness. Tonight, I believe the Lord wanted me to address what it means for us today. Have you ever felt the weight of the world was on your shoulders? Do you ever feel that way? I mean, deep down when it's quiet and you're lying in bed and thoughts come into your mind. As Simon said this morning, thoughts buzzing around like bees around a hive. Sometimes you just cannot switch off. Perhaps when you're driving or walking alone and you start thinking about where your life is heading, what you've done, what you haven't done. Do you ever pause and consider what your life amounts to and realise you come up short of where you wanted to be? You're frazzled. You're hanging by a thread. Well... There is restoration. There is renewal. You've got to hang on in there. Or maybe you feel like the little animal in the cage, inside that wheel, running the wheel round and round, running, running, and getting nowhere. Perhaps life is a treadmill, the same old, same old every day. You're working harder and harder, but you seem to be getting nowhere. You feel overlooked, underpaid, not appreciated, even unnecessary. There are many versions of what we can be going through. One of the major ones is feeling like, I have to get this job done. And what about the other jobs that need doing? Which one is priority? But hang on, that job can't wait either. If I don't do it, I can't see the job getting done properly. We become very dependent on ourselves, sometimes because we get let down by others. And all the time, we never think to turn to the one who can really help, Jesus. For men, women and children, the way we look, our body shape, the colour of our hair, our clothing, all seem to be the cause of immense worry and pain. We're very hard on ourselves about the way we look. It seems to me that most people at some time in their lives struggle with these feelings and sometimes dead-end thoughts. Some people I know have these thoughts every day, even and dare I say more often than not, Christians. i found, if I'm honest, in my life that some church members always had more problems than people I knew at work who seemed to be without a care in the world. Why is that, I wonder? Had they become, as we heard this morning, like the children of Israel, moaning, 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 because they only had manna. 
Derek preached last week about being still. We're so busy all the time chasing, chasing life. It was a salutary lesson. Remember when Derek shouted, God says, be still. Well, it woke me up. I don't mean that I was asleep in his sermon, (laughs) but it woke me up. He was saying that we have to take time out, especially for listening to God's quiet voice, spending time with Jesus. As Simon said this morning, spend real time with Jesus, simply just being with him. If you take stock of your life and find yourself saying, what difference does my life make? I'm a nobody going nowhere. Hang on in there. Jesus has the answer. Or perhaps you are lonely, hardly ever speaking to anyone except when you come to church, but don't see anyone through the week. At my last church, I was desperate to make sure we called on people we found out were lonely. So many people are lonely, especially if they're housebound. There is so much we can do to help the lonely, and guess what? It makes us forget how we are feeling, helping others. Depression. Depression is a major factor in today's world. Even children are depressed. Depressed, sad, lethargic. I worked for many years for a pharmaceutical company who manufactured antidepressants. And believe me, the depressed population in the UK is huge and increasing. But it's not just the UK, it's the world. And if you knew how many tablets are prescribed for people with depression, you know that there's something wrong with the world. It's as if they have become something They themselves do not even know. People don't even know themselves anymore. I admit preparing this talk has made me aware of how much we need to try to get closer to people who are in contact with us day by day. Just a kind word, a good morning, helps us to connect. When I go walking the dog early in the morning, I say good morning to people you'll be amazed the number of people that put their head down and walk by that don't want to say good morning to you. It's amazing. If you're feeling like, does anybody really know me or care for me, or any of the feelings I've described tonight, when you feel like a nobody going nowhere, then you're in the right place at the right time this evening. God has a word for you tonight in Psalm 139. He wants to show you a different picture of your life. He wants to give you a picture from the top to help you see the meaning of life, of your life, from his perspective. No matter what stumbling blocks we have before us, David the psalmist reminds us God is with us in the midst of them. God, who is at our heart, knows what is inside of us, even on the darkest days when we cannot see any way out. God is our strength. God reminds us that we have it within our capacity to change. You know, I would never, ever have believed that if it hadn't happened to me. God changed me. And I would never have believed it if you told me. But... I'm living proof that God can change. We cannot flee from God. We cannot flee from ourselves. But with God's grace and help, we can creatively work together for alternatives and solutions to whatever we face. We can only face down our demons with God's directions and help. It may not be easy, but it is possible for you to allow God to change your life. God is with us wherever wherever we go. However far we may need to travel from home and however long we may have to stay away, however much it may seem at times that we are alone, 
we're never really alone. You know, nothing escapes his all-seeing eye or his all-knowing mind. There are examples in scripture where we see Jesus casting meaningful glances as he knows the intimate details of people's lives and minds. In the story of Peter's betraying of Jesus, Jesus predicts that Peter will betray him three times, yet he denies it. When this does come true, we see that the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. In Revelation, Jesus appears with eyes like a flame of fire and says to the seven churches, I know your works. Well, we heard this morning that Jesus has looked at this church and said, ABC needs a divine and spiritual reset and simplification simplification and we must pray into that when Jesus tells the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee praying before God at the temple the one who goes down to his house justified is not the Pharisee who performs for the outward appearance of his actions and prays he is not like other men rather God who searches all hearts and knows men's thoughts and actions knows that the tax collector is justified because he recognises his sin and unworthiness of mercy. God is watching us every moment of our lives with his searching, penetrating, piercing eyes. We also cannot avoid God because there is no escaping from him. In scripture, we see Adam, Elijah, and Jonah all attempting to hide from God and his call from them. Hebrews 4.13 claims, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Every part of our life, moment, movement, and microscopic detail is revealed and <coughs> known to him even if we think we're sinking into a deep dark pit or at the very point of death there is nowhere we could possibly go ever where God isn't with us behind us and before us and above us and below us accompanying us through the finest moments in our lives and the worst moments too I was thinking about Sue's mum as I wrote this in hospital a few weeks ago where sadly she left us to be with her maker. God bless her. The experience is often one with the patient surrounded by medical equipment, tubes in the mouth and throat, monitors giving out alarms, strange people coming in and out and pain and discomfort and a present sense of death. And of course the worry for the family seeing the loved one unable to speak and in pain. But what we found in that room with Sue's mum was that with constant prayer and scripture reading, we felt the presence of God with us. And in particular, her mum responding when we asked, do you want us to pray and read the Bible to you? She answered with a nod. We knew she wanted us to pray and read the Bible. It was the help and the solace we needed being in God's presence. Knowing he was with her mum, with us every step, every breath, until finally she was gone to be with the Lord that she loved. Granted, being in God's presence can be a double-edged truth. Most of the time, it's tremendously good news. But every now and then, we may find ourselves wondering why God has to be quite so ever-present. Jonah, for instance, who tried to run away from God, commanded to preach God's word to the worst of Israel's enemies. He caught the first boat headed in the opposite direction. 
The text says he paid his fare and went on board to go with the sailors to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. O oh, Jonah, we say to ourselves with a smile, there is no away from the presence of the Lord. In God's presence, in God's presence, is the only option ever. We know that. And sure enough, God is with Jonah in the storm at sea that seems to result from his disobedience, in the belly of the fish, which incidentally Jonah calls the belly of Sheol, the underworld of the dead. Even when he's rather unceremoniously deposited out of the fish's mouth back onto the shore, God is with him too. As Jonah, Jonah finally goes to Nineveh to obey that original command. We might prefer God was only around when we are behaving ourselves, but it's a kind of package deal, isn't it? God always being there means God is always there in our finest moments and in those we're none too proud of. There are indeed thoughts that each of us would prefer God didn't, God did not have access to. God always being there means God is always there. When the psalmist says, even before a word is my tongue, on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. He doesn't give us the option of a filter system where only our good thoughts make their way to God. Again, in our finest moments, in those and in those that we're not so proud of too, God is there. How many times have I wished that I could have bitten my tongue before I snapped back at my dear wife? Still on balance, on balance, I'd rather go through life with God by my side than not, wouldn't you? Particularly when the God who never leaves us alone is at the same time the God who promises to forgive us for our less than exemplary decisions and actions and for our less than honourable thoughts. I confess as well as I did this that I needed the assurance that God remains with every one of God's children all over this deeply troubled world. Those who lost loved ones, for example, when that plane was shot down over Ukraine. Victims of the ground offensive in Syria. Thousands upon thousands of children fleeing violence in their home. Countries and, refu and seeking refuge across our borders. You remember those Nigerian schoolgirls? abducted months ago, some who are still being held captive. God, I cannot begin to fathom why so many suffer so much. But I do know, I do know that God is there, no matter how terrifying their situations may be. You remember I mentioned about the way that we look. If you don't like what you see in the mirror... You are taking your cues from the world, not from your heavenly father, the incredible God who made you for himself. There's no one in history who is just like you. He gave you your personality, your abilities, your spiritual gifts, and a particular purpose that sets you apart for him. You are his treasured creation, made in his likeness. God knows you, he wants you, he made you. Such an important truth is the fact of God's constant presence with us, that Psalm 139 takes its place in a long line of biblical reminders. The ancient Israelites moving from place to place in the wilderness before entering the promised land found that Yahweh camped out right along with them, appearing in the form of a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire to guide their way as they moved from place to place. When the temple was finally built in Jerusalem, King Solomon made clear in his prayer of dedication that God would dwell there, certainly, but never only there. Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built, he said. 1 Kings. 
Throughout the New Testament Gospels, we find reminders that Jesus himself was Emmanuel, God with us. With the gift of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, in the book of Acts, the constant presence of God was passed along to the entire church. And in the letter to the Ephesians, we read of the breadth and length and height and depth of God's power and God's love. So what difference does any of this make? It means that there is no circumstance we will ever either endure or enjoy in our lives where God isn't. No one single second of our lives when God won't be there. Indeed, God is the one who brought us here in the first place, knitting us together in our mother's womb. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. The message of Psalm 139 remains the same. God, you are there. All the, day, all the days ordained for us were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. David says that here that our life was already written by God, that the Lord has carefully mapped out the details that will fill your days, ordaining what will or will not happen, provided we are following him. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and hope. Jeremiah 29. But, you know, God does not set the plan in motion and then look the other way. He greets us each morning with fresh mercies and new opportunities, ready and willing to walk with us every hour of the day. I thought it was remarkable, Simon said this morning, the manna was here for today. The manna is Jesus, is for today. Don't eat the manna of today, tomorrow. In other words, the past is gone. It's a new day every day with Jesus. Every morning, reset your compass with prayer and start afresh. You know, it, it's amazing, but he loves our company. God loves our company. And he has specific plans that you alone can fill he knows you, and I think this is the most amazing thing. He pursues you. He knows you, and he pursues you. That's amazing. He made you with a purpose in mind, and he's ready and willing to live out those plans with you each and every day. Listen for his still, small voice. I am glad you are my child, Let's run this race together. That's what he's saying to us. And a crisp, clean, ten-pound note is worth exactly the same as an ugly, old, dirty, well-used ten-pound note. No matter what we've done, however dirty we've got, if we have confessed our sin, we are worth the same to him as a saint in heaven. You may feel like you've been stepped on, beaten up, worthless, useless. But know this, you matter to God. Maybe your parents said things to you that ring in your ears today. Maybe you had a hard childhood. Maybe your spouse has rejected you, verbally, physically, emotionally. But don't let what others do to you define you today. Don't draw conclusions about yourself based on them. Look higher. You matter to God so much he sent 
his son Jesus for you. You belong, you are cherished, and you are wanted. Now I know this is going to apply to a couple of people here. Overworked? Listen to me. Then take the bull by the horns and say, No, I am going to spend time with Jesus. I'm going to spend time with my family. Do you know that work was probably being generated by your own need to be seen as busy? That's what men do. That's what some women do as well. If you're... If you own desire, it is your own desire that you have to perform to be seen to be justifying your job. You know, for years and years, I went down that path, working 14, 15 hours a day, and your family suffers so much for that. God suffers so much for that. It's just wrong. You know, you can say no. Remember, you're his forever, and he loves you. This was something that I thought was really profound. In the Royal Christmas Message broadcast on December the 25th, 1939, England was just on the brink of World War II. King George VI read the famous poem known by Minnie Louise Haskins. It went like this. And I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. Then shall be to you better Sorry, that shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. God is so great. Let us rejoice in these three amazing characteristics of our God. There is nothing he does not know. There is nowhere he is not present. And there is nothing he cannot do. We must just trust. Amen.